Hey, everybody, Coach Stefan Rudolph coming to you from beautiful Escondido, California, out here from our Healthy Epilepsy group here on Facebook. And it's a wonderful time, a wonderful event here. Very privileged to be with these wonderful ladies from all over the world, I would say. I guess I can say that because we're here in America. We're here also coming from Canada. And I wanted to introduce them a little by little because Liz Nichols, this information here that you see about Liz, Stacy Chalemi, and then we have our, our new lady, Sue. She's with us as well. And we have a great introduction with Sue because she has uh, got a wonderful book that really changed my life. I had brain surgery. What's your excuse? And I read that in 2005. So I'm very excited to introduce everyone here. And Liz, take it away and tell us what you got. Well, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm totally excited, too. This is amazing. Uh, I'm glad the four of us could come together. So my name is Liz Nichols. I'm from Canada. And what I do is I got epilepsy 21. And um, what I do is I provide coaching for women with epilepsy. Back to you, Stefan. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and uh, take, take it away for Stacy. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know we've had a few interviews as well. You're, it's wonderful. I'm just very excited because we, we're connecting the dots of thoughts, I call it. And all these books that we have, you have the most books. I, <laughs> you just came out with one. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your new book. Uh, well, I developed epilepsy at the age of five through a, um, it started out as a, uh, a little virus and then it had traveled to my brain. I had encephalitis and um, I developed uh, scar tissue to this day. They can't find the scar tissue, but it caused me to have epilepsy. And um, I used, you know, I went through a life, at, you know, living a life as a roller coaster ride. But what I did was I pulled through it. And, you know, I decided, you know, through a lot of things that happened in my life that my passion and my true destiny in life was to help others. So I am an author, a uh, keynote speaker, and I do coaching, helping people with epilepsy and also helping people with other uh, disabilities and illnesses to show them how to live a happy, healthy and productive lifestyle. I love it. I'm reading your book right now that you sent over. And you have so much information. I want everybody to check out her website right here. I'll put it on there. <laughs> and Susie Becker, your book, again, once again, changed my life. In 2005, I started having seizures big time. I had two epileptic car accidents, lost everything, divorced, living with my parents at 34 years old. And I got your book and I read it and I was like, yeah, what is my excuse? You know, <laughs> I had brain surgery. What's your excuse? So I had to start taking on a more positive thinking, you know, with Wayne Dyer and other authors. I just yeah. want to thank you from the bottom of my heart on uh, from 2007, my brain surgery. So tell us about yourself, Susie, and your book and what you're doing for others. Sure. Um, well, I, I mean, that book has been, I, I wrote and illustrated the international bestseller, All I Need to Know I Learned from My Cat, which sold over 2 million copies. Um, but the brain book is a book that I hear from people. Um, now, you know, it's been out a while, maybe, you know, every other week. And um, it, it makes me, um, I mean, I read it, I wrote it, so I, I wanted people to feel like they weren't alone going through that experience, and it's been amazing that it's connected me, you know, with you, Stefan, and, and now with the two of you. Um, so I'm an author, illustrator, cartoonist, um, and uh, I have 11 published titles out. Um, they're all illustrated, um, primarily um, humor. And I have found myself at the leading edge of something called graphic medicine. And that um, is a creation of um, personal narratives or stories about caregiving, illness, health, and recovery. And I do workshops um, and presentations of that. Um, I just did my first school visit and worked uh, with, you know, social emotional learning with uh, third and fourth graders using the same stuff. Um, and the amazing thing, for a long time, I gave workshops on memoir writing, and I still do, and art journaling and things. But with this, um, you see the transformation in people um, in their writing their stories and reframing them and gaining some power over um, situations where we feel, you know, out of control and, and powerless. Um, so that's, that's been a lot of what I'm doing. Oh, I didn't know all that. I thought you just had one book. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. Yeah. Liz, Liz, take it away. What do you have to add with all this? Um, oh, again, just, I'm so excited that we've all come together. Um, I 
honestly, when I got epilepsy 21, there wasn't anybody I knew that had it. There was no resources. Um, I went through it al alone with nobody wanting to talk about it. And uh, uh, I just love that we're actually all talking about it now because, you know, things like um, people would say, oh, she's a nice girl, but she has epilepsy. Or, um, you know, people would always say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. So me being a little bit of a rebel went, well, if you tell me all the things I can't do, what about all the things I can do? And uh, growing up, a lot of it was like, you know, don't talk about it. And I'm like, uh, 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 I'm talking about it, right? So everybody goes, yeah. you built a business around supporting other people with epilepsy. That's not very glamorous. And I'm like, <laughs> right? So my whole thing in life is to um, have resources to help others that have epilepsy and have gone through the trials we've all gone through, um, you know, because it's not an easy journey, that's for sure. And I think we can all agree with that. And I think it's super important that we do open the conversations and talk about it. And having all these speakers and authors on this call is amazing. Um, and all these resources out there, because what is it? 50 million people in the world have it. I think that was the yeah. last. Yeah, I've seen 65 million, but I think um, the WHO organization said it's I think it's million. about 50 million uh, worldwide. And I think in the United States, I think we have about at least four or five million people that have epilepsy. I think it's four million uh, that have epilepsy. Wow. Shoot, I'm trying to get more copies of that book out there. No, um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to interrupt just because I'm getting uh, you know, little flashing things on my computer. Um, I unfortunately have come to this meeting in a car dealership because I have a flat tire and my, my laptop battery is running low. So um, at some point, if I disappear, it's not for... Um, anything that happened in the conversation so i'm gonna put that out there um, it's a little bit like life you know sometimes our battery just dies and we got to reset it and come back, that's right, right. That's there you right. go but you know what that's the thing that's life it, it happens right yeah. It's, uh, yeah and we just have to make yeah. the best of it so yeah let's hope your battery stays running for a while longer <laughs> <laughs> um you know stefan you haven't really talked very much about yourself well i reset my mind and reset my life and it's so interesting that Susie mentioned this about, I don't have epilepsy, I have seizures. And it started making me think about this because maybe from, if other people watch the video, just this past February, I lost my driver's license because I went through a doctor back in October to try to, I did not want to get the vaccine, just a personal decision because I had epilepsy, I had brain surgery and the doctors wouldn't do it. And then they said, you have to go to a specialist. So I went to a neurologist. I told the neurologist, I showed up and told my whole story, just like, I had brain surgery and then I had seizures again. And I was drinking and blah, blah, blah. You know, and then I stopped drinking and the seizures went away. And he said, well, what medication are you on? I said, I'm not. I've been medication free for 10 years. He just looked at me like, what's going on? And he's typing away <laughs> and he put it all in the system. He goes, well, we want to have an EEG. And as you know, epileptics out there, the EEG is the testing. They put all the stuff on your head. They test your brain waves. And I thought, okay, that's great. You know, and I knew somehow it was meant to be in December when this happened. And they scheduled it for January 13th of all days. That's my birthday. So it was just random. And I go, oh, this is awesome. You know, I actually got lost on the way going to the hospital and I was a little turned around, but I wanted to make it. Something told me, take this test. And I went in there and meditated for a half hour. Guess what? Two weeks later, he gets the, he gets the results and he says the same thing we were talking about before the call, that you have a dormant tissue. And we can't, um, I can't risk this having, you have to get on medication. Um, I'm going to have to let the DMV know. I lost my license for two weeks in February this year. And I was just like meditating saying, okay, this is my journey. What is this about? Um, I went through another doctor, a personal practice doctor. I got it back. It was a real test though. I had so much PTSD, I would call it seriously, like, like post-traumatic <laughs> disorder, because I remember driving on a suspended license for three years in 2008 because of my drinking, because of my epilepsy, and I just needed to go to work, I needed to go to the store, and I, I was doing that for two weeks again because of this, and it, it really had flashbacks because when we say dormant tissue or I only have seizures, not epilepsy, I told that doctor, I don't have epilepsy anymore. You know, he goes, well, you may have a seizure, and I can't, <laughs> it was his butt, CYA, right? <laughs> cover your butt, cover your ass. So he, yeah. he had to do what he had to do, that's fine. I'm not mad at him, but it was the system that brought me there. The reason I'm bringing this up is for epileptics out there that are watching us, you know, and, and hearing our story, we can relate in every way. Some people have a little bit of it here. Some people have a lot uh, and we want to be out here. So part of my story is being here to help others 
in my program of recovered coaching. So that's what I do. And and I think I should probably add here because I think we talked about that before the film actually started rolling um, that I said, oh, I'm happy to talk with you guys, but you know, I don't, I don't have epilepsy. Um, I only had brain surgery, you know, but I still have seizures. And, and it was through having to look it up myself and see, oh, well, a seizure disorder, you know, with electroblock, you know, in fact, I do have um, epilepsy. So it's, um, this is my first day with it. Um, and I got a flat tire. I don't think it's really. <laughs> That's a sign, huh? <laughs> you got a little flat tire, needs more air. Needs yeah. Into your life. <laughs> yeah. It really deflated me. Well, that's the thing, though. A lot of people, you know, go through life in denial. And, you know, some people go through in their entire lives in denial. But, you know, you have to, you know, at some point, we, we have to learn to accept that, you know, yes, I have epilepsy. And then we have, you know, some people get very, you know, when in the community, epilepsy community, when I've worked with many patients, a lot of people are angry and a lot of people are depressed. And you have to learn how to accept yourself for who you are and learn how to love yourself. And, you know, it's not going to change. So, you know, I always say the past is the past. We can't change the past, but we have to focus on the present and make, you know, goals for our future and you know we can make better lives for ourselves you know by setting short-term and long-term goals but a lot of people tend to stay in that denial you know because a lot of people don't want to have if they if they accept it then they have to face it and a lot of people don't want to face the fact that they have epilepsy you know it's interesting you brought that up uh, sorry to interject here but the at the age of i guess i was 38 39 um, I got a clean bill of health, right? And they said, you know, your brain scan looks fine. The EEGs look fine. And uh, so you got a clean bill of health. And I thought, oh, I guess that means my epilepsy has gone, right? So, um, and they took me off medication slowly but surely and everything else. So fast forward about 20 years and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I, had, I don't have any longer. You know, I got the clean bill of health only to find out, no, no, that just meant it was, it's dormant in remission or hidden, um, and, you know, and I, so I talked to a couple of specialists, doctors, you know, pharmacists, anybody, cause I'm like, mm? and I think I probably knew subconsciously that I did still have it. But when they said, you got a clean bill of health, I'm like, woohoo, you know, <laughs> only to find out that, yeah, it just means again, it's dormant in remission or hidden. And that was a real slap in the face. But again, subconsciously, I probably did know I still had it. So, um, but I'm at this point, I don't take any medications for it. And uh, I love that we're all talking because I'm learning so much from all of you <laughs> about great tips on, you know, how to live a healthier life because uh, health is so important. That's why I love we have the group called Healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Holistic I, Epilepsy I, Awareness and Loving, Transforming and Healing Yourself. So we came up with that for Healthy. So go ahead. That's great. I'm sorry. I, I imagine probably the listeners will know, but I don't, what is epilepsy 21 versus epilepsy something? What is that? Did you say epilepsy 21, Liz? Is that what you said? Oh, I got epilepsy at 21. At 21. Then, okay, so you're yeah. calling it epilepsy 21. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's me. I, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm, it's that's all, a, it is a good me. mistake. I like that because at 21, we become totally an adult. We can drink. We can, you know, I was in a party phase at 21 and I had epilepsy and I had seizures in college. And I didn't want to change, you know, that's a good yeah. analogy to look at. So there's no mistakes in life. But by saying that, that age is critical. And yeah. I was just like, I'm normal. I wanted to be normal and not have seizures. And right. both at the time said I was waking up in bed all, all like stiff bed and having a seizure and it would freak her out. And yeah. you don't remember that. I just wake up to her look of, oh my God, you know, yeah. the depth, just like, just it looking yeah. at me like I was possessed. It was crazy. Well, yeah, and at 21, it was interesting. Um, you know, I had, I'd been to college, I'd traveled, um, I had my own place, my own car, great job, was going to school, yaddy, 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 yaddy. But I didn't really know what my thing in life was. And, and I was struggling to figure out, you know, I have all this stuff, but, you know, kind of what's, what's my thing, you know, and yeah. uh, boom, you know, within about a year, I think I'd had uh, my first seizure. So, and I never even correlated the two. And I was working with a coach in Calgary. She said, what was going on in your life at the time when you had your first seizure? And I just went, oh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what I was going to do in life. And uh, 
there was the first seizure within a year of that. Weird. Very strange. Yeah. My epilepsy took me on a totally different road because the plans I had for myself uh, were completely different, you know, than who I turned out to be. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started, you know, with dreams of becoming, you know, working for this big corporation and in New York and and being a professional of some sort and and you know drinking martinis on a Friday night and and buying expensive shoes and pocketbooks and all these other dreams that you have when you're in college and stuff like that. And you know, I like I said, I worked for a you know TV network. And when the producer saw me have a seizure, you know, he had his associate come over. And and release me from my my position and that took me on a totally different road you know i i just you know i didn't let it get to me in a sense you know at that moment i just walked out proudly and i wasn't going to let it get to me but it did get to me and even to this day it, it upsets me when i think about it because you know i always thought about what i could have been you know if i didn't have the disorder but we can't sit there just like when someone passes and someone you grieve for that person and you say what if what if what if you know you have to just you you know, you have to just, you know, move on. And I realized, you know, then I started, you know, writing and I started posting and people were coming to me and, and asked me to write more. And I saw how the power, you know, I say the wisdom of words could actually have such a huge effect on someone's life. And then that's when the light bulb went off. And I said, wow, you know, maybe this is what my true passion in life is, not to be a big time, you know, a professional in the city, but to, to help others. And, you know, and I, when I wrote my first edition of the um, Epilepsy, You're Not Alone, it was when someone had sent me an email and said that they read my book, they got it from Barnes and Nobles and it saved their life. And that's, you know, they, they said that they followed my regiment and it was so inspiring and it changed their life and they were no longer feeling the way they were. And that's when I realized this is my true passion because I feel like when you help others, that's the biggest accomplishment you could have is to help others. And for me, it was. And, you know, that's when I realized that this is the road that I was meant to be on. That's wonderful. And Susie, are you seeing the same thing, of course, all over the world? Are you um, getting connection? Um, I'm now getting called because my, I think my car is ready. <laughs> oh, oh, right. <laughs> See, you're, you're resetting your life on day one. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> um, hold on for. For one second, I'm just going to mute myself and, and, and yeah. take care of this. I'm sorry. We'll connect back. And, and Stacey, I love that because your uh, story, all of our stories are amazing in one way, but we have to look at it like a, a learning process and be able to uh, grow from there instead of living in the past. That's what really changed yeah. me. Was I lived in the past for so long, could have, should have, would have. And I love when Tony Robbins says, should have, should have, should have, and then you should all over yourself. And I should all over myself a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I was like feeling, I, I don't say suicidal, but there were times when drinking to escape will be suicidal. Well, you, you used it as a coping mechanism, you know, yeah. like, like many people do, you know, because you, you kind of like, it takes the edge off and it kind of puts you in a different zone and, you know, people use it as a coping mechanism. Cause when you, when you, you get drunk or you're under the influence, you're, you don't no longer have to live and, and face your problems. You know, it puts you, your mind in a totally different zone. So it's an escape mode and many people use it as an escape mode, but then you have to to say, okay, am I a casual drinker or am I doing this to cope with my problems? And that's the difference. You know, when you're starting to use alcohol or drugs to cope with your problems, then there's a problem. And, you know, many people do that because, you know, it's, a, it's an easy way out, you know, but the hardest thing is, is to face our problems and to actually figure out solutions to overcome those problems and to move on. And I think that the biggest problem, the, biggest, the hardest thing is facing the truth, facing, you know, you know, the, you know, where in life, you know, um, you know, what made you who you are today and what 
caused you to be, you know, to be addicted to drugs or addicted to alcohol. And, and it always stems back to our childhood. You know, everything yeah. always stems back to our childhood. And, but the, the, it's, it's the hardest thing is, is facing the truth and having to be faced with your imperfections and, and, and to accept them and to, to make changes, you know, because nobody wants to be faced with their, with their imperfections in life. You know, it's the hardest thing to do is, is to, is to face where you've gone wrong or the people who hurt you in life, you know, you having to go, having to stem back to all these painful, you know, things that we kind of bury most people and push down, you know, I think. So. Face it in order to erase it, right, Liz? Yeah. So from Epilepsy oh. 21, her new group. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but especially at 21, especially at a young age, you're like, I don't want to change. I have to face, but we do, Stacey, we have to face it in order to erase it. What do you think, Liz? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, you know, because again, I, I was at that stage where, you know, young and I traveled college and had a great job going to school and my own place and you know everything was great but it was like okay what's the next step here so it's kind of uh it was an interesting sort of thing and then to have a seizure you know shortly after but one thing uh stacy you just said something um and i want to mention years ago i was working for um a coaching company up here in canada and the, the lady that owned it, it was fabulous and so i was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with her and i was I went to work for the company and her and i did one-on-one -on -one coaching and we're having a conversation and she says, wow, really sounds to me like what you want to do is help others with epilepsy. And I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So I kept working for the coaching company. She's fabulous. And, and then I started to build my business, right? Sort of shortly after that, uh, build the business slowly but surely, but it was through getting coaching with right. her um, that I realized that what I wanted to do is to really help others. I think I knew that anyway, but it was through, she goes, why don't you become a coach for people with epilepsy? Right. <laughs> and so that was the turning point of me starting my business around that. So huge shout out to, uh, to Crystal. Yeah. And Stacy, that's how I found you. Remember, I just messaged you in 2018. I was Googling epilepsy coaching just to see who's out there or see if I came up. I was kind of doing the SEO thing. Yeah, yeah. Like who's Stacy? What's this? And you got all these books and everything. I'm like, I'm not alone. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, and there's somebody else out there that went through a lot more in different ways. Family, light. We all have different lives, but different routes, you know. And so it's really good for us to all connect. Yeah, you know, I I had it since the age of five, and I have to say, for the longest time, I was in denial. And if someone said go left, I would go right because I had to prove that I could do it. I was the normal person you know so for years i was i was very rebellious and i did not want to listen to anybody you know they said you know seizures when i when you when you sunbathe could you know cause seizures well i would go out there i would put aluminum foil in the 80s and 90s i would oil myself to the top to the bottom i'd sit there and i'd have seizures and then i turn over on my back you know and and i keep going you know and and i just didn't care at that point you know and and it was, you know, it, and I didn't even realize how many seizures I was having until I got married. And my husband said, you had a seizure last night. You had a seizure last night. I'm like, I did. I did. You know, and, uh, you know, I got to a point, you know, where especially I think I think it was when I, they released me from my job. That was the wake up call, you know, and I, I, I accepted you know, I finally got out of that denial stage and I, I accepted who I was and I learned to love myself. And, and I think the hardest thing is looking in that mirror and saying, I love who I see. I, you know, I, and so many people don't want to look in a mirror, just like some people don't want to go on a scale and see their weight. You know, it was like, I didn't, I didn't want to see that face because I, I didn't like who I represented and I had to get over that, you know, I had to get over that and, and actually learn how to love myself and, and move on, you know, and uh, it was when I wrote that first book I had reached I when I was in college, it basically, I had I was constantly having seizures because I was sleep, I was doing late night study and never sleeping. 
And when I had wrote a letter into the Epilepsy Foundation and I said, you know, um, I don't know if I, you know, my dream is to finish college, but I don't know if I can do it. I said, does anyone have any stories to share how they cope with epilepsy? And that's when I got hundreds of letters. And that's when I finally realized I wasn't alone because at, at that point, like you said, nobody talked about it. And if you went in the library, there was only a couple of books, maybe four or five books written by doctors. And you had, if you weren't a doctor, you couldn't understand the medical terminology they were trying to explain in the books. It was useless. And um, those letters helped me. They, they actually guided me and gave me such inspiring information that it, it actually helped me get through college because I don't, if it wasn't for all those people writing to me and sharing their stories, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have learned. And I also realized that people feel sorry for themselves. If there's a lot of people out there that have it a lot worse. I was in trial groups and there were people having 60, 90 to 300 seizures a day. Could you imagine that, you know, if, so when you think about it, you know, when you when you're angry that you have something, you think about, you know, there are a lot of people with terminal illnesses. There are those think of those people that have, you know, 60, 90 or 300 seizures a day. They're they're not living life. They're not coping. They, they can't, you know. And, you know, so then sometimes you have to look at yourself and say, you know what, I may not be perfect, but. I, I don't have it that bad, you know, in a sense, you know, and I don't believe in the word perfect because perfect, that's, that shouldn't even be in a vocabulary. That shouldn't even be, you know, in a conversation because there's no such thing as perfect. Nobody is perfect. We all have our flaws, you know, just some people are better hiding it than others. I'm going to add a song right here in the video. So watch this. And it's added there. It's called Perfectly Imperfect. He has lyrics in here that that I just heard about a year ago. But when he said that, I felt the same way. I've always said impossible to I'm possible, impatient <laughs> to I'm impatient. impractical to I'm practical. And impatient is the biggest one. Imbalanced to I'm balanced, but impatient and I'm not perfect. Imperfect, what? To I'm perfect. You know, like perfectly perfect, but we're not, there's no perfection, just accepting imperfection as what is. Exactly. And it to, uh, Louis, I was going to mention Luis Hay and Wayne Dyer. And when they talked about loving yourself, Luis Hay talked a lot about that. And all her, I saw her three times. And it was amazing to hear at, in her 90s, she was speaking, talking about how much problems she had, drugs, sexual abuse, growing up, this hard life. And she had to start loving herself and looking in that mirror, like you said. And I remember at 21 years old, now that you're talking about this, uh, seriously, <laughs> Epilepsy 21, I was at least 21, 22 in college, and I had my, had my first grand mal seizure in the library. Now, I had a high school football injury at 17, but then four years later, I wasn't taking medication. I didn't realize I had seizures still because I was probably having them at night. And yeah. I had a seizure in the, in the library at Chico State in Northern California here, and I was partying hard. It was like all the time, and this was a Saturday morning, and I was... I looked up and the paramedics are there and all these ghostly faces are around me looking at me. And I, and they said, you have epilepsy. And I was like, Oh, I, you know, total denial. Right. Cause when we're 21, we're like, like you said, <laughs> you're like flipping over on the, in the beach having seizures. And I'm just like, no, that's not me. <laughs> and they put me on medication. What does it say on all those bottles? Do not mix with alcohol. Yeah. And I, for the next freaking 20 years, <laughs> I didn't listen to that. No. And most people don't, you know, it's, it's very hard to change your lifestyle when you're used to live in a certain way, because with epilepsy, you have to change your lifestyle. You have to have a specific lifestyle because, you know, many people get angry because the doctors give them a pill and then they expect this medication to control their seizures. Well, unless you create a healthy lifestyle and, and work within your limitations, you're not going to get those seizures controlled or decreased you know, unless you, you know, you have to work within your limitations. Everyone knows what triggers their seizures. If you pay attention to your body, you're going to have an idea of certain things that trigger your seizures. You're going to look at the calendar. You might see, you know, the uh, certain times of the month you might have a seizure, or if you eat a lot of sodium, your body gets, you know, really high in sodium, your water count gets really high. That could trigger a seizure. Stress could trigger. There's so many things, but 
if the, you know that certain things trigger a, a majority of your seizures, then you have to start making changes, you know, and even with with what we put in our bodies, the foods, you know, if your body is working really hard to break these foods that don't agree with you, and you're starting to store toxins in your body, you're actually, you know, putting yourself in jeopardy of having a seizure, because people don't realize, but you know, if your body doesn't break it, it stores it. And if you're storing toxins, you know, foods that have a lot lot of uh, junk in them, you know, you're, you're putting toxins in your body and you're causing stress on your body. Your body's becoming sluggish. It can't work as well. And you're putting your, you're jeopardizing your body to have seizures. There's so many different things, but you have to pay attention to your body. You have to understand what triggers you. And then you have to create a pr productive lifestyle in order to help your seizures. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think I was being super rebellious when after they told me that because I continued working, continued going to school, continued partying, traveling um, and everything else. And if I'd lose my license, I would, you know, ride my bike or uh, take a bus. And I think for a long time, you know, they said, don't go rock climbing. So I did. I yeah. went rock climbing, but it was over water in case, you know, whatever. So um, and they said, don't do this and don't, don't go skydiving. And I'm like, mm, I'm not sure I really want to do that anyway. So um, <laughs> again, I think you get this little rebellious side or the, oh, I'll be okay. But yet I was pushing the envelope, like working, studying, partying on my, living on my own, you know, all that. And then yeah. I was thinking of seizures that were Saturday and Sunday mornings between nine and 10. And after a few, you go, okay, maybe it's alcohol, overtired, push myself too far dehydration, whatever, or wait a right. second, there's tequila involved in a lot of that partying. And I might have a seizure, you know, after that. So, and it's a wake up call. You got to come out of denial and take care yeah. of yourself and, you know, look at the patterns and, you know, what you've done. And when I look back, I just think I was so rebellious or I don't know what my attitude was, but it was uh, denial. I don't know. It's just interesting, yeah. right? And so then one day you go, wait a sec, the healthier I get, the less seizures I'm having. And I think it's one to be normal, like, you know, trying to, you know, that, like, like I said before, that word doesn't, that word doesn't exist anyway, because nobody's normal. And, you know, but you want to be like the way society thinks we are. We want to be normal. I want to be just like that other person next to me. If that person can drink, I want to be able to drink too. Why can't I do it? You know, and you know, you end up, you know, putting yourself in jeopardy uh, of of doing something really bad to yourself. But you, you know, I think for the longest time too, I anything that someone said I couldn't do, I did. I did the rock climbing too. And that in one of my jobs, that was a requirement. They wanted to make sure you were physically fit. I climbed all the way to the top, you know, and, you know, should I have done that? Probably not. But, you know, I wanted to prove that I could be just like everybody else. I call it achieving normality. And I wrote about that because I wanted to be normal again with alcohol too and epilepsy, but I wanted to have just two drinks and be able to leave the bar. I wanted to have just not be able to drink one day, you know, and yeah. not worry not have seizures and not worry about it, not take medication and just be like, oh, that's fine, no medication. And it's just times that we get in our mind, the old you versus the new you. And the new yeah. you has to awaken with that spirit to grow. And I did not want to listen. There was a mouthful of excuses in between the connecting dots of thoughts and the old mind, the ego said, you can drink, you can just have right. two, it would turn into two pitchers, you know, yeah. instead of two <laughs> pitchers. And I was wasted. And then the next day have the seizure problems, have auras. I had a lot of thousands of small malls and just kind of those weird things that people are looking at you and then it goes away. Are you okay? Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I gotta go. You know, you can't even talk straight. And they're like, wow, what's wrong with them? Yeah. And I, was my, coming, I did, didn't want to admit it. Do you know, yeah. um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, Steve. No. I was oh. just, when he said that, he just reminded me like when I first met my, my mother-in-law before I got married, I used to have a lot of focal seizures and like, she's like, she's a really nice girl, but she, she, she has this, she's, she just like stares into space a lot, you know? And it was like, you know, and, and you know, it just reminded me when you said that, you know, with the auras, you know, the um, it's interesting because in elementary school, the teachers, you know, used to call meetings with my parents and uh, they would go like, you know, she stares off into space. And they were saying all these things to my parents. And it was about five years ago, I went, wait a sec, those were seizures or they could have been seizures, you they know, probably were. 
Yeah. And so um, I just found that really interesting that they were like, oh, she steers off into space. And they thought maybe I had some kind of a learning problem or something, um, which uh, may have been at the time, but that probably was the beginning for me. And then at 21, full on. So. Well, that's the main one of the main symptoms is just staring off in space. That's a focal seizure. When you start to gaze, your eyes become a little glass and you're not responsive. That's a focal seizure, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's it's weird because like 70 percent of the cases of epilepsy are unknown. It just happens. And I, I don't even, you know, to this day, they can't even find my scar tissue because I, you know, when my seizures were really bad, I considered brain surgery and I went to Chicago and when they did all the tests, they could not locate any scar tissue. Even even, you know, the doctors in the city that work with me, I had the top the top, you know, um, epilepsy leptologists working with me and they could not locate the scar tissue we you know they they figured with my with my encephalitis it traveled throughout my brain caused such minute scar tissue that it's undetectable and that's what caused my epilepsy so i i have scar tissue probably you know they're assuming they don't know for sure but probably throughout my brain because i could take all different types of seizures from focal to grand wall seizures you know it all it all depends wow yeah uh, well this was wonderful it looks like yeah, we, i don't know if susie got back on did she is susie still no there? she didn't know <clears throat> this was wonderful i the love these conversations they're amazing like just so much great information from all of you. We got to keep this going. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Um, I've noticed that a lot of people have stayed on a very long time to listen to our um, our videos and we should just put it out there once again. If people have questions and they just want to ask one of us a question or they have something in general they'd like to you know, find out because I, I tend to get questions from a lot of people, you know, that they just don't, you know, they don't understand the disorder or they, you know, they they, they hear something and they wonder if if something like that could actually help them you know you know we yeah. you know all of us would be more than happy i think you know oh yeah to and answer one, any questions for example loved ones the one lady contacted me she's the wife and her husband has them all the time at night and so she has serious ptsd from that and oh, she's, wow. she can't sleep. she's always touching him feeling him like sleeps with her hand on him so when he starts having a seizure she knows and it just freaks her out. So people are affected by this and they're both retired and they expect. I had a call if that messed it up or something, uh, but you have a disease that a dis-ease and you also affecting others. They don't live in ease at all. Well, that's, that's the big thing. You know, I didn't realize till later on a caregiver um, goes through a lot of stress. You know, we don't realize it, but the people who watch over us and take care of us and, and make sure that we're okay, they're going through just as much stress in a different way because they're seeing the people they love, you know, suffer from this disorder and they are powerless. They can't put a magic wand over you and make you feel better. They see how you suffer and the only thing they can do is make sure you're safe and comfort you and be there to support you. But that's a very difficult thing. And I didn't realize till later on how it affected my entire family, you know, especially my kids and my husband, you know, my husband would hear the slightest noise and he'd jump up, you know, cause he thought maybe I was having a seizure or my kids too. I would be like pondering maybe and thinking about something. And then my kids are like, are you okay? Are you okay? You know, because they would be afraid, you know, that I was, I was having a seizure, you know, so it, it affects people. People. It really, it really affects people. And, you know, I think maybe that's something we could talk about is the caregivers, because, you know, in our next conversations in the future, because they go through a lot. And, you know, it's very hard for them. And I have friends that their son had epilepsy and was taking seizures when he was young, and then he stopped. And, you know, it was very, you know, stressful for them to see their, their child going through this. Yeah, you know, and it, it is tough. I know somebody I know said that after they witnessed a seizure, they never got over it. Like yeah. it, it, it was such an impact on them to witness this that, you know, they said it, it took years and years. Well, they said they actually never got over it. It was just that 
um, stressful for them or traumatic. Yeah, I think I think that my my kids never got over it. I think, you know, I think it really, you know, they they understand. I even like I wrote a kid's book to try to explain to them, you know, and I, it started out with me just drawing little stick figures on a piece of paper to explain to them what was going on. But, you know, like even like when I got my license back and I was able to drive, I remember my kids were in the back and I was going to take them to Toys R Us. That was the first thing I was going to do when I got my license back. And I remember my daughter, as soon as I started driving, she let out a scream because she was so scared that mommy might have a seizure. You know, even though I was controlled, she just the in her brain she remembers me having seizures and the fear of me having seizures you know and uh you know even to this day like i said my kids they see me pondering or thinking right away they run over to me you know they hear noise in the bathroom right away they come in are you okay you know i'm like yeah i'm you know i'm either you know doing something where I, i'm making noise rearranging something but you know they're just scared that was the most annoying question to me too. Even after brain surgery, when I was living with my parents, my mom would say, looking at me all the time like that too. You okay? I'm like, oh, no. the, it annoys the hell out of me. When it, yeah, well, you know, I know, it, I know it's, it's with like, good intention, but you know, it annoys the hell out of me. I'm like, wait, well, just stop asking me. I said, you know. You know what yeah, it's me funny. Of? Did you did you drink? No, leave me alone. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. When they say to you, "Are you okay?" and you go, "Yeah," and they go. Oh, are you having one of those? Um, no. And just sort of, you know, you're right. Like Stace, like you say, you're just thinking and you're staring off into space or just pondering. And people think, oh, oh, they're having a seizure or something, which is sweet. You're right. But it's it's annoying at the same time. You know, you just want to be, you know, if I have a problem, I'll let you know, you know. <laughs> I work in assisted yeah. living too. So it's kind of like that when they and you mentioned caregivers a lot too. Uh, there's uh, it's like being an elderly in a bed and then your, your whole life has changed. You were, you were active one week and the next week you're in bed and you're bedridden. So it's really hard for them. And that's yeah. kind of how epilepsy can be too. We're not bedridden, but we're, you know, house ridden in a sense. We have to stay home or we can't drive. And it's just like going through a really bad problem, really bad time in life. Well, I felt I didn't drive for 15 years while they were trying to get my seizures controlled. And I felt like I was imprisoned in my own home. And when I spoke to people that um, got their license taken away or they were asked to stop driving, they felt the same way. When you can't, you know, go even just to the store, you feel kind of imprisoned. And when I was caretaken for some family members, they felt the same way. You know, they didn't have epilepsy, but they were older and they couldn't drive anymore and they felt in prison and nobody likes to ask for help. I, I don't like to ask for help, you know, and I, it would be so upsetting to say, can you take me to the grocery store? And even though I know people didn't mind, it still, it, it bothered me to have to ask people because I wanted to be able to do it myself. And with older people and other people, like you said, you live in assistant living, you know, I mean, you work in assistant living, you know, these people remember how they once were in a younger age and they they see how they are now. And I guarantee you, it's very depressing. I know that my my family members remembered before they got sick how they once were and now they see themselves declining. And it's very upsetting when you see yourself declining or you could remember beforehand, probably before you were 21 and before you had your seizures, you know, you know, how you felt and how, you know, productive you were. And if you take medications, a lot of those medications slow people down and can have side effects and people, you know, you have to live with these changes, you know, and it's very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is, oh, go ahead, Liz. No, I was going to say, this is amazing. We definitely have to continue these. Uh, so much great information and experiences that others are going to want to hear that they're not alone, right? Yeah, can, you know. Yeah. Get Susie on here again, too, when she's all uh, charged up again and doesn't have a flat tire and <laughs> <laughs> things happen in life. And also, I'm going to show you something I just came out with and just made, and, and I patent this quote even now. I'm going through a patent process, but turn the FUs to thank yous. <laughs> I got this uh, as a cell phone holder and I came up with this about seven years ago look at put the middle finger in there and you're like hey, oh that's funny that. yeah. so I say, thank you 
And people are loving that so far. If you need one, let me know. There's a link down below. But I want to be able to, to market this idea, the, the message. That's what I'm writing about. You know, turn your F yous to thank yous because I was with epilepsy. I was with alcohol and I was just F this, F that, F you. And I finally went, Shh, thank you. And so to be able to be thankful for what we experienced, 15 years of not driving, um, being, not being able to drink, right, in college or things that happened to us. So we want to be here as coaches and speakers and authors. And as I mentioned about Susie changing my life with that book, those little seeds that we plant everywhere are going to help everybody. So subscribe, like, and share on all our channels here, everybody. And yeah. let us know any feedback. And I, I think gratitude and positive thinking is what gets people through, you know, a lot of these hard times. I think it's very important that people have learned to have gratitude in life, you know, and to be, have to be positive. I, I don't think I would have survived if it wasn't, you know, for, for me teaching myself how to be positive and look at the positive aspects instead of the negative aspects of life. Two entities. Yeah, I love that too. Me teaching myself. So me, like the heart teaching myself to yes. it's just really weird when we say it but weird spells wired and we wire ourselves differently so we say i have to change myself and we change for a while and, and then it's it's a battle though right so many years oh yeah mm -hmm. and i also say it all starts from the heart people think it comes from the brain but it doesn't come from the brain it comes from the heart and we send those messages to the brain you know so it's it's really reconstructing you know your your heart and and listen into what your heart tells you because i always believe that you know our body sends us messages but we have to pay attention and you know listen to what our our those messages are well you guys this has been wonderful um we've got three minutes left on uh <laughs> <laughs> it's just about an hour so um i will send this out to all of you guys so and can I mention one thing before we go? Um, so my third edition of Epilepsy, You're Not Alone just came out. Um, I wrote that book two decades ago, the first edition, and then I had upgraded it. And now I upgraded it again. And it teaches people, it has life stories of people with epilepsy, what they went through and how they cope with epilepsy. And I took the most positive letters and put them in the book. And I also talk about my regimen and how I retrained my brain and how I retrained my life and so right now it's on amazon and it's for free they're running a promotion so if you want to download it for free it's on amazon and you know it's uh it's actually hit number one on amazon for brain um disorders uh so you know if someone's interested in that you know the book is there and it has a lot of valuable information i'll put the link right here so just click on this area and they'll go to that amazon page and be able to, to click on it. And then the information's right here as well. So I'll kind of add that to it. And that way they can find it. That's wonderful. Every seven years, that seven year shift. So look at that, 7, 14, 21. So 20 yeah. years later, 20, 21 years later, you're coming out with another one. So that's <laughs> wonderful. Keep on growing. I'm going to stop the recording here because we're going to lose it anyway. Just set. <laughs> <laughs>